Hello and welcome to Luke Fulian, who's joining us today from the UK. Luke, could you tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, where you are, and what you're, where you're working? Um, yeah, so I, I, um, in the UK, I moved to UK five years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm working in London for a multimedia company, a tiny, tiny multimedia company, mm -hmm. um, helping them produce mobile games for the airline industry. Okay, is is that um, and, is is that Team Seventeen? No, that was Neutral Digital. Um, oh. Very very weird experience down there in London, and then okay. um, due to some changes in the airline industry, it got retrenched. Then moved up here to join Team Seventeen. Mm -hmm. That's where I currently work. Um, yeah, in Wakefield, West Yorkshire. All right, all right. So, oh. bef so <laughs> before you were working in the UK, um, you had, um, a, I think if we go way back, you started in, in South Africa and then you moved over to Australia. Is that right? Yes. So, uh, like I mentioned before, we, we actually see a very similar past right up until um, even our first job at Tasty Poison, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we went to the same college, um, City, Morris City. Yeah, we, we, wow. we, we studied yeah. animation together for like three years, which is the equivalent to like a bachelor degree, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we both started. Actually, you got me started in all this. I know, I'm, I, I'm guilty as charged, guys. I couldn't resist. Because <laughs> like the, the no, truth no, is, yeah. I was... Yeah, because I was always looking around, and then apparently this guy, Steve McIver, got hold of me, and he mentioned that you were like, hey, if you're looking for dudes, mm -hmm. you know, like this guy, Luke, who really wants to, like, get into concert art, and it's like, oh, okay, well, then got hold of him, and then it all, you know, the whole story from there. <laughs> yeah, of course, and what's really interesting about that for people who are listening to this and, and just hearing us kind of relive a little bit of our own history here is that um, you never really know where a job's going to come from half the time because it's like people you know either from college or from a weird networking experience or even people you work with for like a year or two uh, if, you, if you make nice buddies and even where you're working right now, like you never know. They'll like remember you and be like, hey, you know who'd be great on this project? Probably Luke, you know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And just kind of no, it's, it's quite sad and quite true. Um, without a network, you really don't get anywhere. That's why I'm. That's why I always, when people ask, like, "Hey, should I go to college or whatever and study and stuff?" I'm like, um, "It is kind of important, even at the worst case scenario. Like, you're at least meeting people that will eventually move inside circles that you want to work in, and therefore, you know, there's like a connection between stuff you want to do. So it's it's also more about developing connections and stuff." Um, getting to know people and things like that. So it's more of like a pay for social type <laughs> experience. Yeah. Um, and then again, it's also a large part of people don't understand is a lot part of this is working in um, with people. Um, a lot less studios these days are uh, physical based, but the ones that are physical based, you just need to develop you know, it's a lot of social skills and how to work with people in teams and how to you know communicate with people and stuff um also especially as you move up the ranks you, your communication and your personality becomes more and more important right um to the point where you could be the best artist on the fucking planet and if you're a complete asshole no one will hire you they just don't want to deal with the stress of like okay the guy can do the work but I'm gonna have to deal with like three hours of bullshit before he even starts. So it's like, it's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's 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 um yeah. So this it's, it's it's almost being personalities, how to talk to people, how to get people to do a you know like talk nicely to them, get them to change things or whatever, or mm -hmm. figure out how people like to get communicated with. Yeah, so it's it's a huge thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a massive social element to games industry, any industry that people seem to ignore. Um, where well, you've got people like I looked, looked at like Fang Zhu a lot, like watched a lot of his stuff, and he's always mm. on about like getting the skills, the skills, mm. and then that that is a huge part of important. That's getting mm -hmm. in the door. But when you're in there, if you're an asshole, no one's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> It'll take like two jobs for the entire industry just to figure out. Ah, this guy's a shithead. Let's not yeah. deal with him. <laughs> That's true. I almost feel like our tests are important, but they should. 
like the interview is almost equally important because like when you come in and they sit you down and they suss you out you know they kind of are pushing a little bit to kind of find out like who's this person like what are they like yeah, yeah. and 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 do they actually gel with our like maybe our company ethos or like who we are you know yeah. that kind of thing so i wanted to go back a little bit and start uh, like a little bit further back with you uh, uh, maybe some stuff that people don't know about you myself included which is kind of fun um could you give us a little background into um what started your journey into art like way back like how far can you go with this oh we can go to I'm going to my childhood when I was a little boy. Mm. Um, so my mom was actually an artist, an aspiring artist. Um, okay. But obviously, you know, in the in the eighties and the seventies, it's not really much for a woman. Um, she actually got a job as a drafts woman. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather got her the job, and then she didn't like it, so she became a nurse. Mm. I, I just don't ask her how how that happened. Mm. <laughs> But she was always into art and she's always encouraging us to draw and do all kinds of art. Um, I even played violin until I was 13. Okay. Um, there came a point in my childhood and I was, I was just drawing a lot and then playing violin a lot. And then I was like, I had to choose. Um, and I was like, I like drawing a way lot more than playing violin. And, and you know, the, if you think the art industry is cutthroat, just, just try and be like a professional violinist. <laughs> or a musician of any kind. I mean, or a musician. Or, yeah. <laughs> so like, I was like, yeah, art seems cool. And then what eventually got me into to, um, concept art was, I thought to myself, I was like, I like drawing stuff that's useful. It's mm -hmm. Sort of like that people look at and they're like, yes, we can use this in things. Yeah. And we can, you know, design stuff with it. And, and, is it sort of like your, your art gets an, an extra life after you design something or you help concept something, then it's useful to a company where they take it and they go like, yes, now we are going to use this in 3D or in our game or in our marketing campaign or whatever, and it'll, it'll turn into a thing. And then it has an end user that appreciated for its artistic value, but also for its functionality as well. So there's sort of, there's yeah. a huge, concept art is a huge, functional element which people don't understand that you get a technical artist which is half programmer half artist mm -hmm. but no one really explains to you that a concept artist is half designer half artist right uh, and the design part is very important it, it's a huge problem solving it's more it's visual problem solving yeah so designers come to you with problems they're like okay look um, a prime example would be a gun. Like they got, like we've got the sci-fi gun. It shoots laser beams. It runs out of ammo uh, every one minute. This is how they reload. This is the ammo it uses. Yeah. Um, and then they'll tell you like how long it needs to be. So they give you all the parameters, and then you just spew out a bunch of designs. Okay, look, here's your ammo. This is how long it is. This is the, the beam. What it looks like. So you, you're helping them solve the problem visually, and then in an end product, it'll be this this thing. Hundred percent, and and I mean that is uh, a testament to like how good your brief is as well. Like sometimes your brief might not be as strong as that, and you might find yourself like asking a few more questions, like to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Or sometimes you might get a prototype. They'll send you like a screenshot or a video saying like yeah. this is what it does, this is how it animates, this is how long yeah. it takes to reload. So you get a little bit more information, but generally, like as you were saying earlier, uh, communication across departments and with people within. The studio you're working mm -hmm. with is super important for that reason as a concept artist like you have to just kind of hound people a little bit yeah yeah i mean this, uh, prime example is when i started at 2k australia yeah so i went from south africa where i had tasty poison right. Tasty Poison went down. let's go back yeah yeah let's go back and then i started freelancing for a while like a long time and then it started gaining momentum um you know i was trolling unity forums and whatever just just getting anything i can and um, it got to the point where uh, I don't want to burn horn, but what was happening was you go to a Unity forum and someone posted a job, mm -hmm. and the last post was always me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I post saying I'll take this job, and then there's nothing after that. Like all these jobs, right? So I was just like just taking, just doing it, um, mm -hmm. and then it got to the point where I managed to. So interesting. So yeah, there's there's a bit of a weird. So I one of my clients my biggest clients was um crescent moon right so uh we're going back to tasty poison so tasty poison's publisher was this american company called crescent moon games and they published all our we were a mobile game studio so um we, we started off pretty low um, i think our biggest hit was 
pocket RPG, right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it actually yeah, launched an entirely um, like it. I think Pocket RPG helped launch another big company that we. Were yeah, it was basically yeah. Diablo like um, yeah. cutesy Diablo like thing, which yeah. The, I think looking back, the studio's biggest problem was they didn't reinvest everything they made from Pocket RPG into sequels or making more Pocket RPG. They just went on doing some other weird shit. Um, <laughs> like, what was that one called? Dig something? It's the one you were working on. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think at that time, our, our uh, studio kind of split and we were working on different projects at the time. Um, yeah. we were working on uh, advertising work with Rhino Raid and things like that. And I was yeah. oh, on the in-house was... IP, yeah. which was, to be fair, like maybe more visually interesting in some regard, but like not as, like, I don't know. I don't know if it was a great game at all, um, but it was- I, I don't know. I don't know where it is now even. That, that was way back. Like, I don't even think the internet, this, this is old enough for the internet to even forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at this stage, <laughs> she's that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's like, um, yeah, so we're doing that. And then when I quit to freelance, um, I gained a client, another client called Neutral Digital. So I was working for Crescent Moon and Neutral Digital at the same time. So I was doing two jobs, um, just just churning out stuff for them, churning out for Chris and Moon. Right. Uh, for Chris and Moon, they were working on um, Dear God, and he was just doing a whole bunch of pitches. He was doing like mm. a whole lot of like these sort of small games, just trying to launching lots and lots. I think he still does that. Um, uh, really great guy, Joe. Uh, was it not Joe? Wow, why did I forget his name? <laughs> um, Josh. Yes, it's just Josh. Just Josh. <laughs> just Josh. In our Skype, that's his name, guys. Josh, yeah. That's yeah, how yeah, Josh. Remember, like when you when you're freelancing, that's how you remember people, just by the first. Yeah, it's just Josh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That um, John guy. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he pays good. Um, but interesting enough, by a recent tweets, that I found out he pays more than Marvel. Well, that's not that surprising, depending on what the idea. Yeah, is. I was like, because I follow um um uh what's his name um. So for context for people at home, like we're talking about working in indie, indie development. And so yes. Sorry, when, yes. when we start saying things like, oh, this indie developer who runs the show and is getting investment from who knows where and is paying yeah. uh, his employees, his concept artists and stuff, they're, they're pay sometimes an indie company can actually pay more than yes. a AAA or a bigger company. I think that's quite important for people to think, yeah. realize is like, just because you work for a big brand, if, if at the end of the day, you're thinking about financial security or offerings, like you don't really know until you're in, you kind of have to feel things out and, and keep your ear to the ground. Yeah, so that, that was, that was what my, 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 my journey is kind of weird because when I started freelancing, it got to the point where I was earning the same I earn now mm -hmm. if you convert it. So in rands, it was, yeah. it was a with lot with, of money. Right? With, cost, with cost of living or oh, actually, are you saying like, oh, I get you what you're saying. You're like, you were doing well. No, no, like my paycheck yeah. now yeah. and what I was earning then are the yeah. same. Yeah. So it's like, I haven't actually, <laughs> but when you're living in a place like South Africa, the paycheck I get now is like, it's a lot yeah. of money because our yeah. cost of living is in South Africa so low. It's just sort of like, so yeah, at the peak, I was doing those two jobs and a lot of in-between stuff and um, Josh pays really well and Nutri Digital pays very well as well because they, yeah, it's it's freelance rates and yeah, the funny thing, yeah, I'm mentioning. So we're going, so we're here. I'm freelancing, and then I got Neutral Digital and Josh as main clients. And I was doing other things, and then while I was doing all that, um, I was doing some personal stuff, posting things. Good thing about indie companies is they're a lot less strict about you posting work that you're doing. Yes, in a shorter period, they of time. want a lot of it. Mm. Yeah, because they want a lot of exposure. So if you are a semi-famous or a good artist, every time you finish a concept or a design or a pitch, they want you to, you are say, can I put it on my, my Twitter or my art station or whatever? They'll be like, yes, definitely do that. Yeah, just link us in everything. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's immediate exposure. As you're working, you're just doing this stuff out. And then, so you're gaining a lot of like, uh, uh, um, a lot of exposure. And during this right. time, um, 2K Australia got hold of me. And I was like, yeah. uh, so 2K Australia used to be rational games. So talking about Bioshock 1 and Bioshock 2. Right. Um, where, where, was, where was that based? In Melbourne or Sydney? They're based in Canberra. Oh, okay. I had no idea. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, Catapult territory if you look on the, on the map. So it's like you got the Golden Coast, mm -hmm. and then like about an hour in this way, you've got Canberra, which is their it's their um, capital city. Yeah. So um, on the west side. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so right in the middle is where their studio was, like the middle of Canberra. Um, so I started working there because uh, they got hold of me like, hey, you can work for us. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and they're like, are you sure? I'm like, definitely. <laughs> um, so I, I got, yeah, I got a lot of traction there. Um, and then while I was there, just before I left, I got another big client. Um, I forgot what he calls his game studio, but it's a, um, a Hungarian guy called um, Lovely Lovely Man by the name of, I can bring up my list. Why do I keep this? Gabor, that's his name, Gabor. Yeah. So this guy runs everything under the sun. He's got he's got like a food chain running there. He has he, he does like major servers that support algorithms for online gambling studios. Yeah. And so this is like very this guy, very typical of indie development where people yeah. have these pipe dreams who have a huge amount of capital in their pocket, and yeah. sometimes they're not afraid of spending their own money developing games. Yes, yes. So this guy is a perfect example of. He really loves games. He really, really, really loves games. Yeah. But he's got a massive amount of capital and he will spend. And he liked the cyberpunk type stuff I was doing because mm -hmm. he's a very big fan of cyberpunk, the tabletop. This is way before cyberpunk. Yeah. The game. Yeah. He, yeah. Um, so he wanted to make a turn based cyberpunk tabletop type thing, almost in the, the Shadowrun vein, whatever like that, but strictly tabletop, strict DD like rules. Um, his, his game dark was like this thick thing, right? Yeah. So I started working here. What was the name of that title? Uh, Hero Grinder. Okay, cool. I might overlay yeah. some of that as we're talking here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, this, this is quite a lot I did for, he was a good example of while you're working for him, they starve for attention so you can post whenever as things going in. Um, his project was a little bigger than most others, so he wouldn't let you post anything that is a, um, there's stuff I haven't posted that is like a reveal to the game. Mm. So in the game, there'll be like stuff that we yeah, want to play. Unlockables and things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he doesn't want you to post any of that stuff because he wants something for the player to discover. Um, so yeah, that was that was a really nice project. And I had to, unfortunately, I had to withdraw from that and go work. Um, no, sorry. I, no, no, I didn't. I got it wrong. I started working at 2K. Yeah. And then disaster struck at 2K. They got shut down. Uh, okay. about tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. That was just like a, a, a global like thing that happened. Sweet. I think it was in the news. I'm pretty sure I saw it at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened was for some reason Take-Two Interactive is the big 2K. They own 2K and a whole bunch of other American studios and foreign studios. Mm. And they have two major studios outside. They had 2K China and 2K Australia. Mm. 2K Australia used to be irrational. And I think they hit a financial dip after the release of Evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you remember that? Yeah, so absolutely. One yeah, 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 yeah. That one's it's a great game. Great yeah. concepts, actually. Yeah, it's great. Great concepts, great stuff. The game was, I don't it, it just, just, just dipped. Um, yeah. And yeah, and then this was the same time. So they were working on Borderlands, the pre -seek. I mean, yeah, Borderlands pre sequel. Mm -hmm. And I was brought on to work on Borderlands 3. So they were under the impression that they were going to be helping Gearbox with Borderlands 3. Um, and then Gearbox was working on, what's that? They have like this, what was that thing called? Um, I think Gearbox. It's like all the heroes and you, they fight each other or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like a Dota, kind of like a Overwatch. I know when it, they tried to release it and Overwatch crushed it. Okay, so um, did, it, did it get released? I think it got released, but I think it's like dead now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because Overwatch killed it. I wonder what it was. I'm trying to look for it now. The fact that it's not coming up is uh, not a good sign. Yeah, if maybe if if you, if you just go to go to Gearbox, you'll find. Um... This is purely research for guys at home. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We were trying to find out what the title was. And so whatever, so, so, yeah. so, while you're looking, um, mm -hmm. that title came out and did poorly. Battleborn? And then, no. 
content. Yes, yes. Okay. I don't know if it did well or did enough or whatever, but it didn't do yeah. as much as they thought it was. So okay. it was suddenly freed up to do Borderlands 3. <laughs> mm, mm. And then Evolved went down. So then Take Two was like, yes, we need to put money back. And they just went around killing off all their foreign studios. I actually had a friend, the lead artist. I won't mention it just in case he doesn't want to be in. But he left 2K Australia when they shut the studio down to work for 2K China. Hmm. And then 2K China got shut down two months later. Oh my gosh. So like the... So for everybody at home, like the the move from South Africa to Australia is not a small one. It is yeah. almost the other side of the world, if not the other side of the world for us. Uh, even though we're still in the Southern Hemisphere, it doesn't matter. It's really, really far. Like you got to, Southern Hemisphere and you got the yeah. bottom of the Southern Hemisphere. You have to move. Yeah, exactly. And I think the plane flight is like more than 22 hours, 23 hours, something like that between everything. So you literally uprooted your your life here in South Africa after doing a bunch of freelance, still still feeling some security from clients overseas, and you took the leap. Um, was that Where did that, that bravado come from? Did that come from like the sense of like, I want to work for a bigger studio and, and kind of feel what that's like? Was that something running yes. through your head? Okay. Um, while you freelance, um, I was quite surprised how reliant on my time at Tasty Poison, how much clients fed on that. Um, it's kind of a cash 22 where if you're freelancing, you're much more likely to get jobs if you have worked at a studio. So they know you've been exposed to game studio environments, you know about the, the workflow, the infrastructure, how everything works. You've, I've had about six years experience working there. So if it was me versus someone who's never worked at the same studio, a studio with the same experience, they right. choose me over that guy. Yeah. Even though he might be at the same level or even slightly better, they just knew that I knew how things worked and I'd worked with other people and yeah, they knew that I'd fit. Yeah. Yeah. It's that reliability team. factor that becomes so important when money's at stake, actually, at the end yes. of the day. So they, yeah. So they know, like, if I work, if I'm, even if I'm working remote, if they have a team, when I work with their team, I know where my place is and I know how to feed information or talk to them. I can talk at shop, <laughs> yeah. basically. Uh, basically, you, you hit the ground running um, mm -hmm. that way. Whereas if you're new to studio infrastructure, if you're getting confused all the time or asking who, what an art director is or who is this person and why is this person giving you the stuff, so then it sort of slows things down and you, know, you sort of, um, yeah, it, it's you're less experienced in that matter. Yeah. So what I, why I went to that studio was, yes, it's a big studio, um, a lot of people told me if you just get one of those in, you know, once you work for a big studio, get in there, mm. um, whatever it takes or whatever, right. um, get in there and then just start making even bigger connections because, yeah. um, 2K Australia was a studio full of veterans, like some really big names. Mm. Uh, I got to work with some really nice, very talented people, um, very high up the chain, like really, really nice. Um, and it's, it's a validation. Like, if a studio like that likes your work, then you're like, shit. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I, I'm in the door, I'm in the ballroom, you know, dancing yeah. with these dudes. <laughs> yeah. and, and do you suppose some of that does come from small town mentality a little bit, where you're like, hey, I grew up in this, you know, uh, southern side of Africa where we're like struggling yeah. to start studios and everything. This is before, yeah. like, um, you know, big uh, big developments here happened with Hollywood and stuff like that. And it was around the time where, you know, we were in some of the first studios doing mobile development because that became yeah. a big thing after the iPhone came out. Um, mm. And so with that mentality, leaving college and having like the rest of the world out there doing their Hollywood stuff, we kind of looked at the industry from a perspective of like, wow, wouldn't it be great to work for those big companies? But what are we going to do right now? And so you and I, in many ways, were like, I always say like South African artists uh, tend to be quite good for our level of experience because we're like in yeah. the wild west, you know, so. It's, yeah. Yeah. Because it's that level of insecurity, just that much more insecurity makes you <laughs> work that much harder. That's I true. Mean, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's just because we're like, oh shit, you know, I, I've got, I've got, I, I, don't, I don't know how good these international people are because they can just walk into like, oh, you know, really cool studios or even like the, the 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 academy you're trying to have you know way back when like if you tried to start your company it would be like i mean with the internet south africa had it's just a no go yeah absolutely. Um, absolutely and so it's like right now it, it's more feasible like a lot more but like back then yeah it, it um oh 
that 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 much insecu extra insecurity just it gets you really good at art. <laughs> yeah, I I often tell people don't be afraid to be um like scared and like yes. ab about things because let the fear and the hatred drive you in a way like the Sith <laughs> motto, right? Because it it, it, it honestly we 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 run yeah we run yeah, total it, Sith empire yeah. exactly and I are we wrong yeah I, I like to say oh, that. I, I was, it, Sorry, I had a very interesting conversation with a friend where I was like explaining how I drive my art, where uh, you, you need to, it's almost the point where you always want to be working under someone better than you because you want to beat them. You want to total <laughs> sit style. You want to destroy them one day. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's true. I have an actual insecurity. If I work in a studio where I am the bestest artist they have, then you're like, yeah. there's, no, there's nothing to like, you know, grab on and go like, right. I'm going to do this guy and then yeah. you have to be all like self-taught again and like yeah. always there's a lot of pressure you have to be always trending and you have to be always like sort of like so there's no sort of like big dude to feed off of and at 2k <laughs> so there were so many massive titans you were like yeah. yes yeah, give it to I'm me. going to Plug me into try the my hardest yeah, to destroy <laughs> all these people and become the bestest ever and that's what's happening with freelance is it's sort of you can stagnate very easily if you're not constantly being exposed to projects with these really amazingly talented people that are just going to be like you're doing it wrong and you just do it this way and you're like yes 100 <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> so um I, speaking of like we, we've we kind of like glossed over it a few times here but i think also um in in smaller towns in smaller countries especially that are still somewhat isolated away from having that direct networking experience of greater artists um and even quality schools let's be honest um like my question to you is are are you a self-taught artist from the beginning and um would you recommend that for people starting out today my 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 opinion has changed so like oh yeah we talked about earlier where i was like my art i would say my actual art style the way i draw the way i go about it i had to teach myself that mm -hmm. um whereas with the school we went to like city varsity um, what we learned there was how to talk to other artists. That is very important. In our industry, they don't teach you how to talk to other creatives. Because this is some like next level philosophy shit where you have to talk to some other guy who's also a creative mm -hmm. and communicating your vision to them um, without having to draw. Yes, we are visual. Sometimes it comes places where you have to explain to someone what you need from them, like especially if you get an artist working under you or whatever, and where you, you, you don't want to draw it for them because you need to get, they need an opportunity to grow and explore. Right, um, and you don't so have the time, to, actually. At the yeah, end of the day. and you yeah. need to be able to communicate what your thoughts are to them and get them on the right path. And at college, it became really important where you, we had like, you know, when we were talking, we were like, oh, we, we know how to communicate and bounce ideas and, I think our, our end year thesis was the same thing. We sort of had to like sort of get in each other's heads and stuff. Yeah, it and, it it also makes you quickly realize how fragile communication between people can be without someone above everybody saying what to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Everything falls apart very quickly. There's yeah. no leader. Yeah. Um, and oh man, someone grinding all the. Can you know, um, <laughs> no, it's good. It's still good. Okay, right. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's from a communication point of view, but I feel you can get that if um, you live in a country where you, like you said, you get lots of networking opportunities, you can go to draw classes and stuff like that or right. anything like that. But college Eventually. has still has its, yeah, college still has its place where it teaches you how to communicate. And that is right. all the problems when um, it, 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 it will, if you're seeing on a scale communication and skill, you know, communication is a little here, right? Yeah. Um, skill will get your, your attention, but it won't keep you the job. That's so it's sort of like, I, yeah, I'm so happy you're saying that because what I've noticed from, uh, you know, uh, mentoring people in studios over the years and now mm -hmm. teaching is mm -hmm. that the people who are self taught or who come to me and work with me one on one, they don't always have the best communication. 
And yes. with me, it's fine because I'll be your mentor. I'll teach you everything. I'll give you the skill aspect of the industry. But I think if you are self-taught, it's probably on you to go to things like conventions to actually meet other artists, to talk, yes. look over the work. Like even if it means like going to Instagram and having some DMs with people or joining people in a call like this, like it's worth it because like you said, um, you know, you need to have some basic communication. Um, not only in person, but you, you wouldn't believe like email as well. If you even plan on doing freelance, you better be able to put an email together. Cause like if someone can't interpret what you're saying and there's money on the table, like, you know, you're going to yeah. run into problems. Yep. It's pretty, pretty good. When I was freelancing my, so when I was in college before college, I went to a small college before the college we went to mm -hmm. and they had a business English course that, that I took and it teaches you how to yeah. properly format letters and oh, so stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. that forward facing letter when someone pings you and they're like, Hey, can you send me your rates and stuff? And you construct that first email gives them a very strong professional opinion. Um, I had a link to my, um, what was that site? It's like a digital business card site called, not LinkedIn or whatever. What? It? Not LinkedIn. It was a pre-LinkedIn. Pre-LinkedIn. This is this is okay. before LinkedIn. Damn, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dust coming out uh, of that lungs. Uh, oh, about me. There okay. was an app called About Me, mm -hmm. um, and it's a little business card format. It'll have all your relevant links and everything in there. And then my header, my footer, was this About Me section, so people can click and read. You know, like, okay, I can see everything else. Got, just in case you'd only see me on one media platform and I had a link to all my media platforms. Yeah. Um, so I had the, the about me there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just looking professional is, is being professional, you know, typing the right words, getting all that done. And then people like that. Um, so yeah, just being a professional was, was really, really cool. You know, if you're like, mm. you know, send an email to lol okay bro i'll yeah. give you my break oh. exactly. <laughs> and, and, like, and, and it's like and, and you, like yeah you, you don't have any capitalization everything is one paragraph yeah, yeah, like yeah, all... i've i receive these emails from people and i i just like i shudder like I, when i in my yeah. communication with youngsters and i'm just like guys just spend a bit extra time like especially <laughs> when you're dealing with someone who's important, like just spend extra time and get other people to proofread it for you. Like if you have yeah. a girlfriend or a brother or I don't care who, yeah. just get someone else to look at it yeah. as well. Yeah. Like I have this rule, like never send an email like late at night. Cause like you haven't proofread it properly. You're probably gonna no. send something over that's yeah. just terrible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's just college has, a, it's, it's a yes, no. My skills, if you'd ask me what I draw right now, that's completely yeah. self -taught. Yeah. Um, we went to an animation school, so it's not yeah, really, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, but what the animation school did teach us is how to talk to people. Um, it's, it's just like, if you can't communicate, then you're just this, this, this draw bot. <laughs> um, so would you, would you today recommend the self-taught process, the actual yes. skill acquisition to people? Would you still say today it's viable to be a self-taught artist or do you think that maybe the competition in the industry is influencing some of that? Especially, yes, I'd say today, like nowadays, especially with the amount of online content, the amount of online content you can get mm -hmm. way outweighs anything that school will teach you. Yeah, and um, what you and I experienced at college was like, even though we were learning from people, we still looked online and there wasn't that much then, but now it's like a treasure trove. Yeah, we pretty much stole. We still went online. We still went to, you know, they had like Nomen workshops and yeah. all that stuff. And we still go there. We're looking and, at the old yeah. stuff, like the, the like, yeah, second, yeah, yeah. I, I call them the second generation concept artists, the guys after like the Sid Mead and stuff when they started working oh, on my. Star Wars and all those like new age yeah, yeah. CG, early 3D games, like that yeah. echelon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, that's what we did. I, I went online, figure out what's trending, what's not, what's a cool mm. style, what people are doing, what people are up to. Um, art station now is pretty much where I hang out most of the time. Um, and then you got my old weird art account up there. Oh yeah, we're gonna take a look at Luke's old work here. Um, actually, we we can we can I think bring it up. Yeah, let's bring it up now. Why don't we? Uh, let me just grab the uh, account here. Uh, did I, did uh -oh. I foolishly no, go back? Foolishly closed it. Here we go. Okay, that's your R station. Let's get back there. Uh, pardon me, everybody, while I fumble around here. Okay, there we go. And let me share my screen. There we go.
go share. Okay, you guys should be able to see Luke's Deviant Art here. So this cool. is going back a little bit far. I don't know what year this is. I can click on this. Okay, right so that's... This is 2013. Um, so almost 10 years ago. We can call it seven wow. years ago. This is... Um, was this, this was pre-Australia, right? Yeah, so this is all from South Africa. This is when I was experimenting with a square brush. Mm -hmm. I was, I was always one of my one of my big boons is I was always super. It was what got me into stylus. I was super lazy with brushes. I didn't, I wasn't interested in texture brushes or having to switch my brush out to do different things all the time. Nowadays, I'm more into that where I, 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 you need to if you need to get across a certain feeling, brushes help yeah. speed up the process. But back then, I was more interested in in keeping the one brush, but just concentrating mostly on silhouettes and form. Um, yeah, you can yeah, see like it that. All well. of the early work, that, yeah. yeah, that was again that that's that square brush yeah. with. Um, I was really into some like you know cyberpunky, a lot of cyberpunk stuff. So I want to I want to um, point out here to people uh, taking a look at Luke's art. Maybe uh, right now, like the early stuff for the first time, is like it's already quite obvious. Like even at when I was working with you, it was so obvious that you were really yeah. into exaggeration and really into shape. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that. Like, where do you think your like love for exaggeration came through? Was that something you just naturally gravitated towards, or did you always feel like, why is the shape not stronger, and just kind of kept pushing it? Yeah, um, there's there's a T-shirt I want to make. This is um, got good shapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shapes are king. Yeah, yeah, shapes shape, are king. Um, shape juice. <laughs> yeah, shape juice or whatever. Because it's, it's, it's basically, um, I think it was, I forgot the artist said that, but basically at the end of the day, no matter what it is, it's all shapes. You get good shapes, you get bad shapes, and silhouettes help you sell those. And if you have bad shapes, then the artist, wow, that is all. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, this is the kind of work that got you noticed by a company like um 2k when they were working on yeah. a stylized game like borderlands you know they look at this yeah. stuff and they go well this guy's all, almost there like he's almost on our ip you know so yeah, yeah. you know so that was that's all that was guns are really good for shapes um because you're trying to get functionality you're trying to get you know what you want out of it and stuff like that um yeah i was i was always fascinated with, with shapes and the silhouettes and how things connect together like that's also a shape study so you can see the second one, oh, sorry, Thank you. yeah, yeah. So the second version two is 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 uh, so how it moved on to being more aggressive. That yeah. was a game James was working on called um, Who's now Lunatic working Thunder? at Ninja Theory for anyone who's curious. <laughs> yeah, yes. So he he's a programmer, visual yeah. programmer at Ninja Theory. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, for, yeah, this is this is for like an RPG or something. Yeah, that was sort of Tom Sparks. Uh, it was a Kickstarter project. Yeah. That's client work. That's um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's that was, that was client work um, just after for a uh, Hong Kong toy company. Yeah, that wanted to get into games, and <laughs> this is sort of, so this is a game called Glob, where you can evolve these things that fight each other. So that was like one of the ultimate god forums for one of these like weird lobby things. Um, that's again for Lunatic Lander. So and, if, and if you guys are, uh, have never heard of like what it's like to work in indie development, this kind of stuff is pretty normal where you have to create, um, you know, sectioned uh, pieces of background and stitch it all together yeah. using programming. It's very common that you do not just sprites, but like pieces mm -hmm. to, yeah. uh, to yeah. formulate, you know, what makes a game up. Because the more modular you are in indie development, obviously there's less money being spent. So yes. you get to make yes. a product that works on a smaller budget. That's just mostly what they're interested in. If if you're a good artist and you can help them save money, then they'll really like you. Um, yeah. If you're thinking about some modular solutions and you know helping them, helping them, you just need to be helpful. Which is a um, oh man, those are so dark. What, yeah. What were my monitors doing back then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you had supervision as a youngster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was for Josh actually. Um, there was a. Game he wanted made called um, 
something like this. So I want to uh, talk about this project in, in particular, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so Luke and I both worked on this project. We worked on uh, Neon Shadow. And the really interesting thing about this project is that Luke did a whole bunch of texture work for this game, where he yes, concepted yes. out like a bunch of tiles and stuff that we could use as a modular set piece type approach to building these very complex um, environments inside a very limited platformer. And mm -hmm. I, I think, what was the name of the platform? Uh, the the oh man, it was like a like Nintendo oh, it was like, it's like this uh, oh man, I can't, it was like a Kickstarter platformer that they they came yeah, out with yeah, yeah. hardware. And and what's really interesting about this is that if you find or you look up like sci-fi wall texture and you look that up in yeah. Pinterest, you'll actually see your textures come up like a lot of the time. <laughs> Because like people are still people still love these and people still want to use them and like you'll like yeah. people just get influenced by this old art and it's really really cool. Yeah. All yeah, right, so um, I think this is enough for now. We can we can definitely jump back to uh, our FaceTime here, um, and uh, we'll come back to some of that. I'll overlay as we as we talk here, so no worries. Um, but I did want to ask you. Um, so when you first get into a project or maybe you're working on a project for a while what what's yeah. the most exciting part of the work day or the project itself is it like the early development is it like the sketches you do at the beginning of the day what excites you most about the work day um it depends so there's a much, there's two major forms of concept art there's pre-production concept art which is mm -hmm. the very early stuff and then there's production concept art and it sort of shifts in tone and nature production concept art is when a project's already started, um, it already has a style brief and there's a lot of stuff going on already and you need to quickly adapt to the style. So they're not interested in you telling them what a style is or changing the style, they need you to generate new content within a set style. Mm -hmm. So like a 2K or whatever, like with the Borderlands prequel, um, sequel, if they get you to work on that, they need you to generate content for that. And that is, that is the hardest part in concept art is basically adapting to a style yeah. and then being so fluent in the style mm -hmm. that you generate useful new content during production. So yeah. they go like, okay, now we need five new guns in this style that's been designed for someone else. We need a level, we need all this other stuff. So that's the hardest part, that's where you would but also it's the part that gets the least exposure after the project's done because um, it's set to a very strict timeline. They want you to be very quick. Sometimes it's just quick line drawings or mm -hmm. you don't even make it to color versions of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and they're only interested in you relaying visual information to another, a 3D person so they can make content based on the design and what you create. So that is um, the strictest and most grueling part of concept art is that this is like they just want like yeah. one after the other yeah um and wait just a little bit of context is... just just hold on one second a little bit of context yeah, for people yeah. at home who maybe have not been in the industry um so what you're saying is the art you produce in production the kind of sketchy kind of work is that do you think that level of work that you produce during that time is worthy to be in something like an art of book or do you think that's the kind of art you would never see in an art of book no, no, you'll see them in art books. Um, they're usually followed by a tag saying, you know, they'll look like quick sketches. And um, it's, it's a valid and very big part of concept art. Yeah, but, um, but what I'm saying is like a lot of art books just have like hyper polished work and you don't see yes, a lot of hyper sketch stuff. Yeah, that's dependent on the studio and their attitude towards um, if it's an art of where they're trying to show you the whole process, um, where they want to include everything. Um, I think the Borderlands art book um, has all of that, all the sketches and all the stuff there, and they have all the high-end stuff. Um, depends on the studio. If the studio only wants to show the best of everything all the time, then they're not going to make an art book where they include all the rough stuff. Um, certainly, it is very rare for an art book to include things that were canned, uh, ideas that were generated that didn't make it in because they didn't want to... What they don't want to do is, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. They don't want to generate a atmosphere where there was an idea they had and they had to ditch it due to a budget or a time constraint. And then and it was a great so, design. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing design, amazing idea. Everything was good about it, but the only thing that happened was they just didn't have the time, they didn't have the money. Yeah. But it's very hard. They don't know 
it's very hard for a client and end user to understand that. So yeah. they don't want to include content that makes the game look like it was supposed to be better than what it was. Yeah. So dangerous. very rarely you find. But, it's a little bit dangerous. Yeah. Very, to, yeah. Yeah. To show, yeah. It's like, very rarely. You, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's very rarely you find that stuff in. It's always strict like, oh, there's this gun that's in, in the game and, and, and you see the gun, now here's everything related to the gun. And here's the main character, here's everything related to the main character. They won't show you like, there were these three other characters. Yeah. We couldn't do them because they look amazing, but they yeah. are. Yeah, but we didn't have like the hair simulation budget. <laughs> like weird stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to make physics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we want to do this. yeah, exactly. So, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's they, definitely a better part of indie development where they have these crazy ideas and then they get yeah. grounded by their budget and they're like, okay, let's rent it back. But like, at least yeah, yeah. you have that freedom in indie development to push so far. Yeah. Um, and then the fun part is pre-production when mm. um, everything's up for grabs, the, yeah, the budget, mm. everything, blue sky, the whole very <laughs> high end concepts. Yeah. Um, and you're working directly with the art director now, and he's just teaching you everything he wants, and you're doing whatever you want. You're helping shape the IP. You're helping. This is the that's the sort of rock star glory section that everybody is very attracted to. This is sort Absolutely. of like yeah. the fun is, part. Yeah. Yeah, the fun part, and, and you're helping design everything, and there are almost yeah, yeah. almost no limits. Obviously, if you're taking too long on things, they will they will tell you to move on. Yeah, um, and you're working directly with designers, and you're figuring things out. And this is pre-production, and it's all nice and all fancy, and this is where all the good, pretty pictures come out, all the nice mood boards, and the you know you get to work on all kinds of things. Because sometimes, um, depending on on the visual the level of visual they want to go with. Um, it's not always people in the studio, it's people they're pitching the idea to or stuff they're trying to get. They will try and get you to create some high-end stuff because they want a more complete view of what they're trying to achieve. So if it's a huge mood piece where they're like, you need to create the planets and they must do this and that and that. And you need to make like a nice big piece where they'll be like, okay, this is our vision. And they'll spot it there and then everything comes from that. Yeah. Um, so that's the nice stuff. And that's the stuff lots of people think about when they think of concept art, but they don't understand that there's this one half that's yeah, production. And, the other and being good at this, mm -hmm. yeah, being good at this section is what keeps you on the project. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a very good problem solver and you're able to adapt to styles very quickly and move into helping them solve problems during production, yeah. um, is what keeps you on very quickly especially um, i think as a junior artist maybe not a midweight artist the expectation is like hey i have to hand something to you i hope you're able to like flesh it out um that is a very big part yeah. of it yeah this side is what a junior artist begin when you come to studio the production stuff is what you'd get exposed to yeah they're not gonna let you help they're not even yeah they, they might not even hire you at the pre-production level that's for like yeah. experienced pros to kind of come in no, i mean I, went, I, went, I started on pre-sequels one of the dlcs i wasn't in i wasn't in uh, um, definitely not in, in pre-production pre, pre, pre at yeah. all i would never put you on pre but in in a way it's nice because you get to rock up and there are all these fresh ideas already on the plate and you're like wow this is so yeah. cool i can't wait to run with this this is rad yeah but that's where you prove yourself where you're like i can adapt to the start and i yeah. can add it, it's where you feel the most valued because you're part of the development team. You're not part of this like wishy-washy like the vision board. You know, you've come down <laughs> yeah. to the worker and, man's and level. Also, and also, if you're not used to thinking that broadly with with such mm. few limitations, it can be yes. really intimidating. You'd be like, where do I even start? Like, you tell me you want this epic vision. It's like, oh my gosh, yes. where do I start? Like, it can be yeah. scary as, a, as someone coming in as a junior, I can imagine like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is Yeah, so a good studio will get you there. They yeah. need you to help their artists with problems and stuff like that. They get you to think yeah. creatively, design and all that stuff. That's where your design stuff comes in, in a lot. Um, like the best artists I know of are the ones who do like these huge industrial design courses and stuff like that. Because um, their thinking uh, process is so strong, right? They, they yes, come in with a um, design cap. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a lot of, it, it is, it's like I said, it's visual design. You're, so a designer comes to you with a problem and he's like, I need the door to open like a star. Yeah. 
So hold on <laughs> a second. I, I want to ask you, okay, so like the, tr the weird trend that we've been seeing in the last few years, if you go to art station mm -hmm. or whatever, all you see is visual eye candy. And mm -hmm. a part of that is like, oh, these landscapes, for example, are so stunning. They're so beautiful, so well painted, so mm -hmm. meticulous with their atmosphere and their fairies and everything. And you're like, that's great. But can mm -hmm. I use this? Can I actually yeah. put this in a game? Right. And then it's like, yeah. well, when you work on a project, 100 percent for a video game, you're not going to have that level of freedom, like to no. just paint a beautiful picture. Yeah. It's like you need but that's, to produce. That's what I was talking about. That's the, the, the tippy top stuff yeah. where they're looking for moods. Yeah. Um, then you, you do all those landscapes. Landscapes are a tricky one. They're very, very big, broad vision views of the game. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's the amount of usefulness you get out of them is much less the more you move into production because once they've got that sort of like color palette, like, you know, you can look at like uh, No Man's Sky or whatever, when they know like, okay, the, 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 the plants are blue and these are red and this is how yeah. things yeah. operate. They're not interested in that anymore. Very yeah, quickly. Now it's like the nitty gritty design the prop yeah. type stuff. Now they're interested in like, what do my guns look like? What do my people look like? What am I, you know, how do my planes operate? Where, where yeah. does this go? What do the aliens look like? It very quickly moves on from there. Yeah. So yes, so the generally, yeah. yeah. Generally that's, that's a color palette, a mood treatment. Um, in most production, those will be quite quick. Um, they won't be finished to the level where you're sort of like, you know, every single brick in their building is done. No, they're not interested in that. They're like, look, when it comes to bricks, we'll just get some textiles to make some bricks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not interested don't, in don't, that. Don't waste your brain on this. Yeah. I mean, even um, when I was at 2K, the lead artist's, um, his one theory was when we were doing concert art, production concert art, he says he doesn't want to see anyone drawing anything that the engine already does. Yeah. So That's like fair. if you That's totally art, yeah, and he sees you've taken the time out to add bloom or some other kind of strange effect to your concert art, he's like, dude, we, that, 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 that's a tick box. Yeah. In Unreal. And, you will, and here's the I other thing. You to all those tick boxes. Yeah. Here, huh? Here's the other thing. Chance, I worked on a project where I was uh, creating this high end concept art stuff uh, for yeah. things like that, where it was like, what is the mood and stuff? And once I put mm. it together, yes, you have a key image, but that key image in pre production can go into production and by the time it hits the technical artists they've done it 10 mm. times better than you ever could have thought of doing yeah. like the gold looks better than your gold the the bloom looks better than your bloom the yeah. fog looks yeah. better than your fog like it's yeah. just the get you can't make a game look better in a concept art yes. unless it's like you know you spend three years on this piece you know <laughs> like it's, yeah yeah it also starts where you can get lazy in concept art where you just you just get like a color swatch or like a little piece of you know, like if you're drawing a knight and he's got chain mail on, don't fucking draw every link. <laughs> if, if, if anyone in concert art or production sees you drawing like every, yeah. they're gonna flip their lid. Like I you think, won't last. I think, I think when you and I first started out working at Web and Circus, like our first company, yeah. um, I was doing yeah, that because yeah. I didn't know yeah. any better. I came in yeah. from college and I was drawing like every link and, and Evan at the time, who's the uh, director at Free Lives now, uh, he, yeah. he looked over to me because he was the programmer in that company and he, he looked at me working and he's like why are you doing that why are you painting everything <laughs> and I'm like and I looked at him and I was so innocent I was like because I'm an artist and he was like please don't do that <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so it's sort of like you, you, just, you just get a little square piece of chainmail going pointing at it I mean people know what exactly. chainmail is just yeah the call out yeah. On it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the call out as long yeah, as it's like, oh. yeah 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 totally especially with substance these days they've probably got a freaking shader for it already so like why, why are you drawing this chain mail <laughs> that, that, was, that was the thing i told you about with the lead artist was like i don't want you to draw anything that already happens in the engine we just need the idea we just want like um the one design was like this this, this uh ride on mm -hmm. on the uh, thing and they, they just want the ride and they don't want any crazy light effects or any bounce lights and things moving around. They're like, look, it gets lit in the engine, right? We don't need to imagine how it looks. The, the product already exists. We just need the design. We need the base colors, just the base colors, and any other extras that need to go on it or any materials. Like, okay, if you're telling me a section is carbon fiber, just put a little swatch there, say, this, this black area, this is carbon fiber, or, yeah. and this is silver, and this is gold. And, yeah. you know, they're not, they don't want you to, it's quite messy. It's more of like, concept art is more of akin to that sort of, when you look at um, fashion art, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just 
cooler looking. <laughs> better <laughs> drone. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a little better drone, but it's the same stuff at its core. It's, right. it's a design that you visually have to convey. Yeah, and uh, then because not everyone. So is yeah. Same. yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so hold on. I wanted to ask you, like, since you've been in the industry all these years, um, has your impression of the industry changed from what you originally thought it was like? Like, and if it did, what what have you noticed? Like, what was your initial impression for getting into the industry? And like, oh, I know, I know, or have a sense of what concept art is, versus what actually concept art is, or what you've discovered about it. Yes, um, it changed in the fact where when you're first starting out, you're always about, like I keep saying, your visual, and you're always on about like getting your style done, getting you right on paper, you know, getting, I, I want my thing. Mm -hmm. um, I discovered that a lot of studios are a lot less interested in your style. Mm -hmm. They're more interested in you doing their style and they want to know and so this is your style that some indie studios will get to be like, oh cool, we'll make a game in your yeah. cool style, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next tier is you being able to do anyone's style, showing that off, and then they'll be like, oh cool, so you can actually work on our existing product, we'll get you to work with us and you can make stuff for us. Then there's the, the next one where you get, no, sorry, I switched one, doing one person's style, other style, then there's doing any style. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, they are split in two. There's hyper stylized, so your, your blizzards, your riots, and all those people, mm -hmm. and then there's hyper realistic, mm -hmm. which is you know your your Activisions and yeah. your uh, and if you if you stuff. and if you and if you see a lot of artist portfolios, they do tend if they're professional to lean into one or the other. It's rare yeah, to it's, see both, but yeah, it, it generally yeah. goes one or the other. It's 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 this one or that way because entire studios are built onto either one of these because the pipelines vary very differently, especially in the types of people you hire. So right up until even the art director is either one of these or one of these. He's either hyper, hyper realistic, only interested in connecting the next emotional engagement. Yeah, exactly. Or it's, it's like, it's it's like the, the easiest way to imagine it for people out there who know popular IPs in AAA. It's like, well, you've got Naughty Dog who's hyper-realistic and then you have Blizzard mm -hmm. who their entire mantra is like, we'll never do anything that isn't colorful. You know, it's like, it is it's, that different in, in, in terms of like ethos within the yeah, com company. Yeah. And it, it's, it's because these studios have different audiences um, and they get different kinds of investment. It's like the hyper-realistic ones are, are, are invested in, in creating, pushing technology. Yeah. You'll notice a lot of these studios push the envelope. Yeah, insane the engine, and they get investments. Else. Yeah, and they get like, like, like we mentioned, Ninja Theory is one of those where they get a lot of investments and a lot of intention, uh, attention every time they push the envelope, every time they develop new audio technology or facial recognition, yeah. you know, acting type stuff. Yeah, or, and they'll tell you about uh, it. <laughs> pardon? They'll tell you yeah, about they'll it. They'll tell As you a about gamer, it. They're like, this is what you want. We'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, and they get a lot of attention from that. But then what you do notice is the why I chose stylized is uh, I like doing it. And I like, you know, I was interested in shapes and accent, accent, you know, expressing things and stuff. This side has a hell of a lot more money. <laughs> yeah. Indie studios, big, big studios. Everyone on this side has so much more money because their titles last way longer. If you have a stylized title, like WoW or anyway, they endure for decades. Whereas on this side, it's going to get to a point where it will be so realistic that it will definitely endure. But you'll find a lot of these games, they endure because they don't of hold up. Or yeah, like injury. the visuals don't hold up after, over time as well. No. People become critical no, I mean, of how unrealistic these realistic titles yeah. become. Some of these titles die within three years after they're made. They're sort of like, not die, but they're like, oh, there's another one who's made that's something way better than what yeah. you know, because it's closer they're pushing. Yeah. That's really interesting to me because if you see some of the titles that were realistic but were actually great games, you see that a lot of the time what happens is they get remakes. Like remember like yes. Call of Duty 4 was such an, uh, an incredible, I think yeah. it was like uh, Modern Warfare 1 became so popular, they recently redid yeah. it. And then uh, yeah. another one was um, I think Silent Hill 4, I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah. like those kind of games where the plot is so good that people want to revisit them. Another one recently is Final Fantasy 7. Of course, just people are so bonkers about this game and now they've kind of pushed it towards the realistic envelope which is entering this whole yeah, yeah, other yeah. like realm yeah. of like was that the right decision and all the fans are kind of divided on that now yeah i mean it's, it's also and on the other side if someone remakes wow wow get crushed 
<laughs> so it's sort of like yeah, the original. The style's like, yeah, but but yeah, yeah, exactly. if, if even if you look at WoW now, how many times has that game been updated to look better? Like over the years, they've yeah. just kept up with it. They've kept it stylized. Yeah, but, people, but it looks as better. you probably noticed, there's probably a graph somewhere that goes every time they updated the style, their user base just kept doing this to the point where they had to get rid of all the extra stuff, re-release WoW Classic to get their users back. Up. That's <laughs> actually that's actually a fair point. Like you do notice that yeah. in the industry, it's like it'll it'll like peter off, and then they'll go, great, how do we research this? And suddenly there's like a spike, yeah. and then it goes yeah, down again. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, but yeah, so, some of them are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how you make an enduring style. And I was I was interested in more, stylization creates more of an impression. We think Pixar and all of those, even animation studios. Very um, Yeah, it, it, they last so much longer, and people, yeah. and the more you get people to fill in with their own stuff and stuff like that, it it it, it, it lasts longer. Mm -hmm. Realism, as a concept artist, I was also scared of realism because. Right now, the closer you get to that envelope, I mean, you could just take pictures of people, and that's your concept art. Right now, <laughs> we're, now, like, now we're going back into like the philosophy of photography versus like painting. It's like that sort of same yeah. vibe. It's like yeah, I'm yeah. Like, so, but as a content artist, where you, your only use on a studio like that is helping them solve problems, is this production part. Yeah. Pre-production just looks like a bunch of pictures of moods and stuff and people and things. I mean, if you look at the latest um, Last of Us, what, what does a mood board like that look like? It's just pictures of places and post-apocalyptic. Yeah. No, it'll, it'll, it'll be, yeah, it'll be like photos. Yeah, photo yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the worst art book I have there uh, for concept art is the Assassin Creed's one. They are literally just drawn overs of old people going to museums and taking pictures of old swords and jigging them a bit and, you know, pulling uh, design swatches from something else and putting it on an old piece. Yeah, it's and the hyper -realism. Even the way he looks. Yeah. You don't need a high-end, like, skilled concept artist to do that stuff because it's this... Yeah, it, the focus shifts from concept art to the game artists being able to do... Um, realistic stuff. So yeah, it, it, you become a little less involved in the visual development part of things. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, like I often think like video games to me and film are gonna merge pretty soon because of the realism, right? I think that yeah, films, yeah. TV shows, like we're already stepping away from cinemas and stepping into things like, you know, Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff where people are consuming content mm -hmm. directly. When is it gonna come to the point where, you know, we have hyper-realistic um, VR experiences that are like Westworld, you know, where we're sucked into the plot yeah. and we get to live out our fantasies, right? I, I feel like that's close, what do you think? It's getting close. Um, as, an, as an example, you know, um, the Mandalorian series. Right. They don't even use green screens anymore. Yes, it's that was hyper amazing. Realistic. Yeah, it's hyper-realistic, giant LCD screens. I love it. They produce everything from lighting, yeah. the environment, everything. So bonkers. Even... It's so bonkers. It's like you don't yeah, have to worry about so... um, color grading as much or... Yeah. Jeez. So like, if you watch The Mandalorian, everything else but the characters and some of the interiors is all generated in 3D. The whole freaking thing already. And you're just like, and they already have the 3D environment affecting the physical world with lighting and stuff. So wherever he yeah. stands or everything stands, it's all affected with him. But yeah, it's really close. It's really um, close. It's, it's really a matter of replacing the actors with us and just having us walk around. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Um, it does get to the point where there'll be more philosophical studies in like, are people more interested in watching people or interested in watching CG people? Right. Um, and do right now we've been getting away because most of the CG people are people just in blue in suits, right? Mm -hmm. So they know, you know, like, like um, mo mocap suits. So then mm -hmm. they know where there's a real person. Um, and you can tell it's interesting. Movement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's an interesting philosophical thing where people are like, oh, robots are going to take over everything and no one's going to, even the artists and stuff. And I'm like, People who make those statements don't know art. Art, people are only interested in buying art from other people. Humans are very selfish as a species. We're only interested in stuff we create. If, yeah, if some fucking robot goes and auto-generates some freaking masterpiece, I'll be like, that's cool. It's made by a program. And then if like an, a dude makes it, because you know there's pain and suffering and like 
40 years worth of freaking self-hatred is coming through the canvas <laughs> yeah yeah it's all that pain is coming through the canvas and you would be like i will buy that i will spend money on that pain i'm not going to spend money on some fucking oil generated shit that some yeah. fucking ai is spewed out even if it's as good or even better hipster art. humans are selfish People we're only interested in buying things yeah from other humans right i mean there's the whole handmade stuff as well yeah. like if a is made by hand it's yeah. infinitely more expensive than something put 100%, together by a 100%, robot i 100 percent agree with that it's it's actually yeah. um the japanese model i don't know if you follow uh, lexus vehicles at all but one of their mm. principles is they produce a huge amount of those vehicles by hand and you see yeah. them constantly pushing the envelope they, they came up with like a new type of paint that they put in there and it's all handcrafted oh. hand stitched like using special like mesh that can only be generated by like someone who's had 50 years of experience putting this together like yeah, a machine yeah. can't do it like nuts 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 stuff where you realize oh, okay mm. this is the future now the future is becoming like hipster r 2.0 you know i just feel like people yeah. are gravitating yes. towards yes. that yeah because it's just every time i hear that philosophical thing is like ah oh, they're going to come for your concept art get computer generated designs and all that right. shit i'm like look you can get an ai to be as clever as you want and generate as much as you want humans as a species aren't there's no market for it that's why the ai industry has such little interest because people just aren't interested in it sure if you can automate a bridge being built yeah or driving me somewhere yeah yeah or google driving you somewhere sure but i mean like when it comes to art and music you you want it's the mistakes that you buy it's the mistakes you want the, the little quirks and the little discovery processes and things it's, it's, that's what you're interested in and Improvise. that's what i like is yeah, yeah but that's what i like when you watch those things as a concert artist you're like yes i'm super safe i'm the, I'm the last of the automated process and the machines will be they'll come for me but like my argument, <laughs> they'll come for me love it yeah but by the time by the time the machines get to my level or our jobs and can replace our jobs we're fucked somewhere here already. Like, you know, why would time a machine can think creatively and generate unique new content and artwork that's actually useful, by the way, useful, in a production series, then like that machine's taken over half of everything already, you know, like we're, 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 in, we're in, you know, Terminator territory a long time ago. <laughs> like by the time a machine's that smart, you're like, yeah, we were fucked. I, I've given up being an artist and I'm living in a bunker somewhere because like, yeah. <laughs> so speaking about uh, living in a bunker, uh, comes the next question, which is, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, how would you describe or define artistic success as an artist? Like, what does that look like to you personally? What it looks like to me is when you're working for a company, um, I know this is going to sound extremely Japanese-esque, but the more useful you are to a company and the more, the more professional you feel, mm. uh, the more... The, the, the designs and stuff you generate um, are useful to them um, and the more often it is. So you get to a process where there's an exploration process where you're generating a lot of silhouettes and designs and stuff and trying to figure out what would work for the studio and all, all the project you're on. And the narrower that section becomes as you develop as an artist where you're just generating, you're literally your second idea is spot on. That's where you, you sort of you you know you're 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 getting everything that they're that they want, and then they know you become more useful. Your discovery phase is a lot less yeah. um, for them. Yeah. Then they know like yes, this guy will get everything we're into because working for a company like Team Seventeen, they use so much titles because they're the publisher now, right? So the faster I can adapt to each title and generate new you know content for them that that's useful, the more useful I am. Um, with a lot less discovery because you, you sort of become less of an impact on their budget. Yeah, and kind of like that. the hyper efficient arrow in their company. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, love that. I, I love that for two reasons. One, I'm a big proponent of selling people on this idea that if you're working in this industry, you need to be a value provider. And the other part of that is that I asked you what it's like to be successful as an artist, but you turned it around on me and you said, what is it like to be a successful concept artist? And I like that even more. Yeah. So awesome. okay, cool. um, <laughs> the, I wanted to ask you, have you ever thought about starting your own kind of project, something that you could take a little bit further, whether it's a comic book or something for yourself that could be, maybe turn into something? Um, I have. I have a lot of ideas bouncing around. Um, all of them are too big. They're way too big. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I can draw from them. Um, I use what I do with 
a way I differ from most other content artists, you get a lot of them leave to go do their own projects, right? Mm -hmm. What I do is I come up with these big ideas, draw a few things from them, and then they slowly, in this, we spoke about this two sections for concept artists. Mm -hmm. It's important to you, but this production, and production thing, but this, yeah. and pro this section, where this section is grueling is it takes, sucks a lot from your imagination. And if you're taking all that stuff that you're generating and moving it into personal projects already, when the company you work for, it comes to this part, you can't use any of this because it's already, you're already making that comic book in that style. You're already yes. making that, you know, crazy, whatever other thing. So you're like, mm, if I start pulling this into that, then either I have to ditch this or they're going to go like, we have seen this yeah. in there. Please don't do that. So right. if you're already taking all these cool thoughts you have, putting them into your own project. They may make you money or may not make you money. It's a risk because you go like, okay, I've got aspects from these ideas I have that I can squeeze into this already. They're all just coming straight into. Yeah. So they make you more successful as a concept artist. Whereas if you're doing your own personal stuff all the time, it makes you more successful as an artist. So you're remembered for your own things or you want to be remembered for the things you made on a project. Right. Um, that's why I feel where if I developed any of my ideas, they suddenly exist and they're not allowed to be used in this section. So it's sort of mm -hmm. like, there's like a, there's an overlap that happens. Um, yeah. yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> okay, awesome. So um, I like to end off with a nice big fat question for the guys who uh, have made it this far. I think they deserve it. And that is um, based on your own experience. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommended advice for, artists who are trying to break into the industry today, like young artists? Okay, so yeah, my first advice is obviously from when we said is go to school. <laughs> um, learning how to communicate is a huge part of everything. Learning how to, it helps you think as well. When you talk to other artists, you, you develop a bond. You can sort of feel that artists think the same way you do. And the struggle you had or having is the same as theirs. And it's sort of like, so you get to know how to communicate. Once you know how to communicate, you'll understand how studios communicate and what they're interested in. And then you'll be like, okay, so I know from my experience, like if I want to work at whatever, and I can communicate with them, I understand where all their art's coming from and what my designs should look like. So if I, I think it was, uh, who was it says like, for them, a pretty picture versus a picture of 50 dollars. If you can design 50 different dolls, right, mm -hmm. and have that in your portfolio, yeah. like the stuff on my art station, the, the actual concept art gets a lot more attention from professionals than the pretty pictures do. Yeah. If you, when you early, early portfolio, if you're generating, if you want to be a concept artist, yes. if you're generating 50 doors a day, 50 windows, because that's what you end up doing. And yeah. if you can show a studio, that you can generate lots of unique ideas for them to use, they are way more interested than that because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want pretty pictures. If you're spending a month drawing a single character in this highly rendered whatever, stuff, that's not, you, that's an illustrator. And right. even as an illustrator, there's a new set of skills you need to learn. You need to learn composition, you need to learn posing and, and all kinds of, there's a whole thing for that. <laughs> but as concept artist, design is important. Um, not necessarily sticking to a style. Um, being able to imitate styles is also very important. Makes you more versatile and more employable. Um, and being willing to work for smaller studios. That was my, the big difference between me and a lot of other people especially at our college, was, oh, I wanted to work for the biggest freaking studio under the sun. I'm going to go right. work for Blizzard. I'm going to go work for Activision. Right. And you'd be like, I will work for anyone who will hire me. <laughs> That's and the then, kind of attitude. And then, and, then, and then do a great job, right? It's not just... Yes, and do a great job. Yes. yes. That's the one thing is always do a great job. Um, people are usually empathetic. If you're having problems, communicating your problems to them um, is often way more helpful than not telling them. If you're saying, hey, I'm really struggling with the design or I'm struggling with something, I need help. Asking for help is, in a professional studio, asking for help is not a problem. It's actually encouraged because your employee wants to know where you struggle. They want to know where they need to develop you and they want to know how you think and what your limits are. So they know yeah. in future, okay, if I give this person this thing and it takes exactly. a second time, and they can see when you are getting better. 
Yeah. So if you've asked them for help for a specific thing in the past, and suddenly you ask them for less help as they give you a similar, like you struggle in environments, and they give you environments and you're asking for less and less, then they can see that you're developing and it reflects better on you. But if yes. you didn't ask for help and you just keep delivering it faster and faster, it just looks like you were slow or didn't care. Yeah. And then you're just getting faster. Whereas keeping in touch with your employees and employers and, and making them know where you stand mentally is, is important. And 100%. it helps show you growth. 100%. I'm going to take that point just a little bit further from my own experience, which is, um, art directors love it when juniors or, or midweight artists come to them because they are actually saving the company money. Because at the end of the day, when you come to me and you say you have a problem or you can't execute on something, I, number one, will help you faster, which will make you improve faster. And number two, you're eliminating the possibility of me giving you more of that work and taking more time to produce that kind of work. In other words, if I hand yeah, you the no. things that you're not good at yes. and you take longer yeah, to produce no. them, then you're costing us money. Yeah. I'd rather give it to that other yes. person who's more skilled at it, take the work they're doing yes. and give it to you. And then yeah. everybody's working really efficiently. So from an efficiency point of view, communication is so powerful within a company. Yes. Um, so yeah, amazing advice. I agree with all of it. Because an art director, an art director, when they have a bunch of people working in, they're trying to develop a visual map of what type of artist you are. And you're trying to as well. If you're going to be honest with yourself, you have to be honest with yourself. If you say, I really suck at environments, I kind of don't do really good at environments. And when a, a, a art, yeah, like you said, when the director knows this, they know where, what shape you are, if you're going to the shapes analogy again. Exactly. So they know what you look like. If it's all just black and they don't know what's going on, then they'll be like, I don't really know this person. I don't know what they're capable of. They're yeah. just kind of slower sometimes and kind of faster yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Ask I think, them for help. Yeah. Uh, like if you as an artist coming in can alleviate insecurity above you in a company, mm -hmm. that is so yes. powerful because like everyone who's got insecurity at any level is freaking out whether or not something's going to work or not. And so by yes. having good communication, and this is something again, just so mm -hmm. under spoken about as an artist, like yes. if you're a shy person, I get it. You're shy. You don't want to talk, yeah. to people, but at the end of the day, like just suck it up. Go to that person yes. and be like, this is my work in progress that I've spent the last two hours on. Am I fucking around? <laughs> yeah, or, or am I, I, or am I like hitting yeah. something and should I keep going? Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that I think is quite important. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, it's amazing. Key. Yeah. It's concept art is visual communication. Uh, yes. Being able, and, and, and if you, it depends on the industry you're going in. I mean, we talk a lot about games, but I've worked for non-game studios as well. And the, 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 the stuff is the same. Um, it's just that the, obviously the end product changes. Um, but what remains constant through every type of concept is communication. Um, communication with clients, communication with people above you, communication with people around you. Getting the work done is all about talking. It's just communication. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, we're doing it right now. Look at us. Look at us. Yeah, we're doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it right now. This is how we're doing it. Yeah. yeah. What you mentioned with the art director is as you move into bigger studios, you get, when you work with these big art director types, that becomes very important. And yeah. a professional art director will never slack you off for asking for help because they know it's a part of their job, by the way. It's mm -hmm. part of their job description is to lead people in the right direction. And right. part of leading people in the right direction is to know their weaknesses and help them develop it. Yeah. And um, in and fact, in fact, it doesn't even stop with the art director. If you want to know how far this goes, I mean, the art director is reporting to the producers in any given project. And that is going to be important because the producer is the person who's spending the money, right? Usually, or in charge of at least doing some of that, right? And so when the art director is in communication with that person, that person says, how is XYZ character, uh, sorry, uh, um, um, person, not character, um, doing in a company, like, are they, are they struggling? Are they good? Like, how has their um, internship gone? You know, you get all of these questions coming at you. So the better you are to the people above you, the more chance you have of a long term position in that company, because you're creating a strong impression. And when that person asks, say, me in a company and says, like, hey, how was that artist? And I say, amazing like dude working yeah, with that artist yeah, has yeah. been so amazing they've overproduced they've hit every deadline yeah. they've been there yeah. that's all the words coming out of my mouth is what you want to be representing in a company yes. so that you know you're good and then it won't be long before you're in that same position yeah and i mean it's it's, it's more you'll get more of a japanese salaryman philosophy 
Exactly. Um, a problem you have is a problem the company has. Mm -hmm. So not telling them about your problem is you're making the company weaker, which means they don't appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, so, be, so yeah. You, yeah, just always get your problems and then they will help you fix it because, um, yeah, they're more interested in fixing, helping you become a better, a better part of their structure. Yeah. Um, the hom homogeny. Uh, what is it that my, my wife lived in Japan for six years and she taught English there. And uh, in Japan, they have a phrase that they, they have above every um, chalkboard that they teach mm -hmm. their, their, their society's children. They say the, the, yeah. the, the nail that sticks out will be hammered down. And it's like, it's pretty <laughs> harsh, but it's, it does, it does speak a lot to the homogeneity of like, yeah, yeah the system right it sounds harsh but i mean in, in the saying itself hammering down a hammer isn't a bad thing a hammer wants to be hammered down. i mean a nail wants to be hammered down i mean mm. if you have a hammer a nail if it's yeah. you don't well, want to stick out. out no you don't want to stick out i mean yeah. you don't want to stick out i mean people people have used that saying for like Ooh, if you're going to be different then you're going to get squashed but it's like right. no it's more of like if you're you're if you're how, a, how do you get along you have a problem, they'll fix it yeah how it do you could be yeah two ways yeah totally. So guys, that's it for the, for the interview. I want to say thanks, Luke. I think our takeaway here is communicate people. Just be really good at yes. it, you know? Just communicate more. Don't just work on your art. Actually work on you as a person. I think that's going to go yes. a long way. Um, so Luke, thank you so much for making the time with us today. Um, wish you all the best for your career moving forward. Um, yeah. Thanks. All right, man. Cool. Have so all right, I'll catch you soon. All right. All right cool. Bye. Next, next Bye. time I'm in the UK, I'm coming to visit you. Yes, please. <laughs> all right. Cheers, man. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.